Margaret Thatcher was the first woman to govern Britain and the longest serving prime minister of the 20th century. Her political and personal style was impossible to ignore. She dominated the work of government in a manner that ensured much of what was achieved would be forever associated with her and her alone. But while our collective memory of Mrs. Thatcher will be slow to fade, how do the changes brought about during her 11 years in power affect us now? What is the legacy of Thatcherism? The Conservative Party Manifesto of 1979 had at its heart economic reform, including most notably a commitment to amend the power of the trade unions. During the winter of discontent preceding Mrs Thatcher's election, industrial action had caused chaos in the country. Strike action in 1979 caused the loss of 29 million working days. By the time Margaret Thatcher left office in 1990, that figure was down to just under 2 million. The unions had been tamed. When she became Prime Minister in 1979, it was perfectly clear to the mass of the British public that the unions had overplayed their hand. The whole kind of idea of there being a national agreement on policy and what we would pursue had dissolved. She came into office riding on the back of that, riding on the antagonism the unions had created, and was really able to go to town. The defining moment in her crusade to curb union power was the defeat of the striking miners in 1985, something for which Mrs Thatcher had long been preparing. When it came to the miners' strike, I think what was extraordinary was how united the party was behind Margaret Thatcher and indeed a very large part of the country. Uh, bear in mind that the miners had been on strike over and over and over again. They had been part of what brought down the previous administration. They'd been part of what had destroyed Ted Heath's government. And the whole idea that you could just go on strike and that you could bring the country to its knees was one that Margaret Thatcher was not prepared to countenance. When there had been the threat of strikes in 1981, she paid them off, but at the same time then set up systems to ensure that next time it happened, we'd have them. Mrs Thatcher had been fortunate in her choice of opponent, for there were many in the union movement and in the Labour Party who had little sympathy for Arthur Scargill. He had actually ludicrous revolutionary ambitions. He really thought that the strike weapon could so fundamentally undermine the democratically elected government as to bring it down. And of course that was his absolutely vital and basic miscalculation. 1984, Great Britain. The more the rest of them, get a move in. The public did identify it as a battle between battling Maggie and uh, uh, rebel Arthur. And, uh, you know, that suited her. and It made it much easier for it to win. The collapse of the miners' strike signalled a wider breakdown of union power. Where once the Trade Union Congress, the TUC, was a force to be reckoned with, now it was relegated to the sidelines. More significantly, the reforms brought in under Mrs Thatcher have more or less stayed in place. After Thatcher, you could never again have a country that was dominated by the trade unions, or one where the strike was the most important economic weapon. That implies that the power resides far more with management, with business, we do live in a free market economy, we live in a free market Europe by and large, and opportunity creates wealth for individuals and prosperity for the nation. That's Thatcherism, and it's now widely accepted. Even Gordon Brown accepts it. Running in parallel with changes in trade union legislation was economic reform. A monetarist, Mrs Thatcher wanted to reduce the role of the state in the economy. Working with her Chancellor Geoffrey Howe, she approved an early shift from direct to indirect taxation, together with cuts in public spending. In the short term, this led to a doubling in the number of the unemployed. It was a bitter pill to swallow. I think that some of our colleagues, and indeed even we, didn't realise just how tough it was going to be. But the condition that was 
always dominant. If we were borrowing money still, in order to finance expenditure, we, we couldn't afford. We have to, had to pay interest rates to borrow it. And the market wouldn't let us borrow more, except at higher interest rates. So we had to follow monetary policy by reducing our borrowing. It was really, there is no alternative. What startled me almost was the fact that it was being done with so little sensitivity to the short-term politics of it. It was a great dash, uh, really, to try to transform enough, quickly enough, to be able to get re-elected at the end of the term because some of the first benefits would be starting to show. That is actually what happened. If I could press a button and genuinely solve the unemployment problem, do you think that I would not press that button this instant? Does anyone imagine that there is the smallest political gain in letting this level of unemployment continue? Or that there is some obscure economic religion which demands this level of unemployment as part of its grisly ritual? Mrs Thatcher resisted all calls to reverse her fiscal legislation. She stuck steadfastly to her chosen economic course. Despite a shaky start, after two years, the green shoots of recovery started to appear. Between 1981 and 1987, the economy accelerated impressively. At the same time, inflation held at around 5% or less. I think that her real uh, triumph uh, was economic. We were in a very desperate way in 1979. I mean, the, really things were, we were going down the plug hole. And due to her determination and her vision, she turned things round. And I think that that was quite a remarkable feat. Otherwise, I think we would be in real trouble. And that, I think, is her, her legacy above all. By 1990, however, inflation had risen towards 10% and the economy was on a downturn. Fairly worried, yes, indeed. I don't think anybody really is particularly secure, especially the dealers. Basically, had a good time over the last few years and if it all goes, it goes. We MPs, we had on our hands a recession, a nasty one. The, the, the constituencies economy sort of fell off the cliff in 1989, 1990, housing market collapsed and there was big trouble. Opinion is divided as to whether Britain would have fared better or worse during the global economic recession as a result of the earlier reforms presided over by Mrs Thatcher. But another aspect of her economic strategy has stood the test of time, privatisation. During Margaret Thatcher's time, I think we privatised pretty successfully and the outcome has been some very important international businesses which have done very, very well. Mrs Thatcher considered privatisation as fundamental to improving Britain's economy and, as she would later recall, a central means of reversing the corrosive and corrupting effects of socialism. Her plans met with very little resistance. Once privatised, the old state monopolies became far more efficient and profitable. Such was their success, even Labour rejected the idea of re-nationalisation. The ones we've privatised since, like British Rail, not been quite such a success. And my own feeling was that Margaret had a pretty shrewd idea of what would work and what would not work, and that she was not actually prepared to bring to the fore. Perhaps we should have listened to her more. Privatisation also paved the way for deregulation in the City of London, the so-called Big Bang of October 1986. The basic idea was that if you free it up, Britain can compete in the world. And Britain can also be a place where people from all over the world come to compete. Uh, and this was essentially fulfilled. Uh, and so it's economic liberalization, um, it's trade union reform, and it's privatization. And suddenly, um, we are an open market, and we're an open society. And that has huge cultural consequences, economic consequences, social consequences, uh, some of which, you know, make very good satire about yuppies and so forth, but which undoubtedly created an enormous increase in freedom and prosperity. Privatisation led to a trebling in the number of people who held shares. Together with the sale of a million council houses, this represented a huge expansion in property ownership. It was a great thing to do, and the fact that thousands and thousands of family did this showed that it was on the right track. And we've now got amongst the best housed nations in the world. 
And that includes the people who are still in social housing. Their properties are in far better state than they were 20 or 30 years ago, far better. And that's largely due to Margaret Thatcher. Not all observers are quite so enthusiastic. Some allege the sale of council houses has contributed to a shortage in social housing and even fueled the buy-to-let market. I think the longer term uh, impact has been disastrous, frankly, that the public stock of uh, you know, public housing has been irredeemably reduced. Nothing's ever been done to make up for that loss for these sales to private tenants. And uh, I think it has had a catastrophic effect. And that's why people now say they can't afford to buy houses and all the rest of it, because they aren't, can't housing is no longer an option. But that doesn't alter the fact that in the short term, it was extraordinarily popular, with especially that group that the Tory party at that stage was really targeting, you know, the sort of more prosperous elements of those who at this, that stage were earning weekly wages, not salaries, anything like that, and who were, I suppose, regarded as the C1, C2s of the electoral kind of, uh, you know, lineup of uh, how you look at classes. As Mrs. Thatcher had intended, her economic reforms struck at the heart of socialism leaving it as good as dead. Maybe she was responsible for the creation of new labour. She, I think, would like to believe that. She'd like to believe, above all, that she killed socialism in Britain. And I think you can say that in terms of what the old believers always stood for, nationalisation, full employment, all that kind of thing, I think that uh, she can claim to have uh, ki killed the spirit of old labourism. Britain changed the way it did business, and that in turn had an impact on the social fabric of the nation. Everybody's crazy, you know, materialistically. They're all sort of, um, because so if somebody's got a 27-inch telly, I've got to have a 33-inch telly. Whether you can afford it or not, that doesn't mean a thing, you know. Um, everybody's into spend, spend, spend. It was a revolution which took many years in the making, but which has transformed the face of this country and, to my mind, makes her one of the greatest prime ministers that this country has ever had. Economic reform didn't just apply to domestic politics. Mrs Thatcher wanted to reduce the British contribution to the European community budget. It took five years, but Mrs Thatcher won lasting concessions. Despite, however, coming to power as a pro-European, her approach to the budget and subsequent negotiations did little to endear her to other European leaders. It's a matter of plain common sense that we can't totally abolish frontier controls if we are also to protect our citizens from crime and stop the movement of drugs, of terrorists and of illegal immigrants. So the message which Mrs Thatcher has brought to Brussels, the home of the European Commission, is plain enough. She believes that Europe must work more effectively, but she is determined that the dream of the Eurocrats of a united Europe must remain no more than that, no more than a dream. I think that uh, the, uh, some of the European heads of state did not get on very well with her uh, or she with them. Um, and that was that. But she was pro-European uh, when she was in office until quite late on. It was only when she began to fall out with Helmut Kohl uh, and began to get sort of towards the end of her period of office that she began to get on very bad terms with some of the other Europeans because I'm beginning to worry about how far they wanted to go. Mrs. Thatcher's stance on Europe and her mounting hostility towards a single currency and greater European integration alienated not just her fellow heads of state, but members of her own party. It was the issue that would prompt her deposing. Her position shifted with the passage of time. She was a vigorous advocate of the yes vote in 75. And in 1985, I think we presented a document uh, to Chancellor Cole of Chequers, called Europe of the Future, which spelt out a lot of what has since been achieved, including the pursuit of a common foreign policy. Um, she became less enthusiastic about it, as it appeared to her, and to some extent to others, that the community was taking too much trouble in certain, too much power in certain directions. She felt a sense of betrayal because she said that she was misled uh, by the rest of Europe as to what was really going on and the scope of what would happen. And so in l later years, she was very, very happy to rewrite history and to say, in a way, we was robbed. 
Lady Thatcher came to Brighton with a copy of the Maastricht Treaty in her handbag and a deep distrust of Brussels in her heart. Her arrival in the hall was carefully staged between debates. The party managers were holding their breath. She'd already savaged the government's European policy, more words in the hall, and the conference could have erupted. After leaving office, she would continue to speak out against the European project, even if that meant criticizing John Major, the man she had backed for the leadership, and his government's policy. There are enough opposition politicians and media commentators rocking the boat. We do not expect the elders of our own party to join this unhelpful cause. A show of affection at least from the Prime Minister, perhaps disguising the relief he felt that she'd not attempted a speech. But though she'd not fired off another salvo, Lady Thatcher was far from being back in the fold. She was ushered off the stage and soon after left by the back door. He deeply resented Margaret's attitudes to him quite quickly. And of course she, she became his fiercest enemy and did her damnedest to bring him down in the succeeding years. John Major and later Tony Blair would foster more friendly relations with their European partners, but warm words cannot conceal the fact that Britain has yet to adopt the Euro. In contrast to the verbal combat that characterized her relationship with other European leaders, Margaret Thatcher had the willing ear of both the American president and the Soviet leader. Her special relationship with Ronald Reagan and her ongoing dialogue with Mikhail Gorbachev played no small part in helping end the Cold War. It placed Britain ahead of many other countries in its influence on global affairs. I think the downward decline of Britain's power in the world stopped. Um, that would have happened anyway. We, we got rid of the empire. Uh, we joined the European Union. We had the relationship with the Americans. Uh, the Commonwealth is what it was, is and not more. Um, and since her time, we have been uh, on an even keel. Our decline has stopped. Hugely important. Mrs. Thatcher was also a friend to Eastern Europe. In an interview for the Daily Telegraph in 1990, Mrs. Thatcher claimed to have predicted the collapse of communism way, way ahead of others. Post-collapse, the newly freed nations took Thatcherism as the model for privatizing their economies. Mrs. Thatcher, too, was a popular figure, and even now is far from forgotten. And I was really waiting to come until this country had a new rebirth of freedom. The inspiration of Margaret Thatcher, that the Cold War could be won, uh, and that there were certain values of freedom and the rule of law, uh, which should be applicable to all societies, uh, and were just there waiting for the societies of Eastern Europe to uh, apply them, uh, that has always been an inspiration to, to many of our colleagues, particularly on the centre-right of politics in countries like Poland and the Czech Republic, so they are very conscious of her legacy as well. Further afield, her influence is still felt in the former British colony of Hong Kong. Working with her Foreign Secretary, Geoffrey Howe, she signed an agreement with China in 1984 that guaranteed, once the British lease ran out and the colony was handed back to Communist China in 1997, Hong Kong would continue to experience a degree of autonomy and retain its capitalist economy. We are privileged today to take part with our Chinese friends in the unique occasion. Deng right. Xiaoping, the Chinese negotiator, was a man of equal calibre to Margaret Thatcher, if you like. But he knew that my client was as awkward as he was, and it helped us get the right result. Mrs Thatcher's pragmatism allowed her to negotiate a constructive settlement with a communist regime. Similarly, in seeking a way forward for Northern Ireland, she made a controversial decision to involve the government of the Republic in negotiations about the province, which led to the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985. Inside, the two leaders put their names to the agreement. The two are united in hoping it will reduce violence in the province by isolating the extremists. But in terms of selling it, their needs are very different. Although far from successful or conclusive, 
it was the start of a process which continued under John Major with the Downing Street Declaration and eventually under Tony Blair with the Good Friday Agreement. She took the first steps on what was a very long road and it's taken a long time for us to get to where we've got to now, but I think she deserves credit for that. Despite Margaret Thatcher's myriad achievements, it was her own party that ousted her from office. But her departure did not heal the party. Neither could she be restrained from trying to exert her influence on party affairs. He's terrific. Have you seen his policy statement? We've got something to direct our debates to. It's got the best organized conference. It's a prelude to victory. Is he tough enough on Europe, do you think? Well, we all cooperate with Europe, but we're going to keep our sovereignty. We're British. It is that idea of sovereignty and Britishness which seemed to fuel her far more controversial remarks at a reception this evening. In private, she's known to take a far from flattering view of the countries of continental Europe, especially the Germans, but has always been careful about her public utterances on the subject. Tonight, she threw caution to the wind, and with William Hague smiling and applauding beside her, she spoke her true mind. Britain still has an important place in the world. We're quite the best country in Europe. After she'd lost office, by after two or three years, she became sort of, sort of crazily Eurosceptic and put everything down to Europe, her own fall from office and everything else, began to make wild remarks from time to time on the subject. Uh, and nevertheless, her support for people like Haig and Duncan Smith was very valuable uh, because the, the Conservative Party faithful uh, were increasingly Eurosceptic. Pro-Europeans were leaving us in both voting terms and membership of the party. They were going after the Liberals mainly. Uh, what was left was becoming a Eurosceptic party. Thank you very much. 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 Mrs. Thatcher even adopted a new persona to remind party members of just who was head of the Tory family. We've still the same convictions. We've still got a strong leader, and Granny is still around. Since she left office, I think her influence has been enormous. In some ways, it's been very difficult for her conservative successors, all of whom have found themselves with a party that really wants her back and that will not accept any alternative, uh, not until somebody young enough to be her grandson has come along in the form of David Cameron, and he's found it very hard going to try and reform the party in his thinking. Until the memory of Mrs Thatcher and her government absolutely fades from the public memory, British people will never vote for the restoration of any form of Thatcherism. And enthusiasm for return to that kind of politics and that kind of conservatism is limited to elements in the Conservative Party and amongst uh, a particular kind of Conservative voters. If Mrs Thatcher divided her own party, she had an almost greater impact on the opposition. By the time Tony Blair was elected new Labour Prime Minister in 1997, the S word, socialism, had all but been banned. The size of Mrs Thatcher's majority in 1983 and the fact that she had a substantial win again in 1987 had to be taken by the Labour Party as an instruction about uh, what we had to do in response, that simply kicking it against the traces and being a perpetual party of protest wasn't a serious possibility, not for a party that wanted to secure the support to be democratically elected. If we could have the first agreement signed, please. By contrast to her significant influence on the Labour Party, her impact on the position of women in politics is considered negligible. One of the extraordinary paradoxes about Margaret Thatcher was that um, she wasn't a sister. She had come through the system as it was, and she had succeeded. Uh, she was quite 
scathing about feminism and particularly about those movements that said oh we the reason we don't get to high positions is because the system won't let us or the men won't let us or somebody is stopping us and her response would always have been well there's a system try it and I agreed with her with that the trouble was that even then her attitudes were those of her generation but almost not of her time and by that I mean she still saw men as more important. It was almost instinctive. During the whole 11 years that she was in power, she did not promote a single woman from the House of Commons, and there were a number that were pretty good, into the cabinet. She is severely criticised by only having had one woman in her cabinet, Baroness Young, I think, was the first two years. And uh, I think the only thing you can say is that she didn't think they were worth having in the cabinet. Now that may seem to be an extremely harsh judgment, uh, uh, but the record is there. Margaret Thatcher's legacy is evident now and will continue way into the future. It is perhaps fitting that her role in Britain's political life was best summed up in 1991 by the then American President George Bush. On awarding her the Presidential Medal of Freedom, he described her as the greengrocer's daughter who shaped the nation to her will. By whatever standard, and regardless of the contrasting assessments of her achievements, it's a remarkable story. Indelibly, to her credit, is the fact that she had the guts and the uh, tenacity to become leader of the British Conservative Party and to fight and win those elections repeatedly. Nobody can take that away from this very particular woman. The single greatest achievement of Maggie Thatcher was to make this country governable once again by a democratically elected government. That has changed history, will carry on changing history, and for that, every, every future Prime Minister will owe her a huge debt of gratitude. I think she stands as the greatest peacetime Prime Minister of the 20th century. It's hard, of course, to compare Prime Ministers in completely different circumstances. Uh, and so we have to rank Churchill and Lloyd George as, as great war leaders, as quite exceptional Prime Ministers, even standing alongside all the, the three centuries of Prime Ministers. But I think we can say of Margaret Thatcher that she was the greatest peacetime Prime Minister, and had it not been peacetime, she wouldn't have been found wanting then either. You can order Margaret Thatcher, a tribute in words and pictures, for the special half-price fee of £10. Call Telegraph Books on 0870 155 722 or order online at www.books.telegraph.co.uk.